My name is Barton Morris. This is Travis Copenhaver. We are lawyers with the Cannabis Legal Group, and this is Cannabis uh, Legal Group Live. Yeah, cannabis cannabis Business Live. Live. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those titles. We kind of just, you know, whatever sounds good at the time, right? <laughs> cannabis, yeah. uh, today we're going to talk about uh, caregivers uh, and their relevance in the medical marijuana and even uh, recreational marijuana. Uh, market here in Michigan today, uh, and they are incre they're increasing relevance because uh, mm -hmm. we are getting a lot more questions about it. Uh, caregivers have been in existence through the Medical Marijuana Act since 2008. Uh, they are now a fundamental uh, manner of uh, the distribution and production of, of cannabis uh, in the medical community and now in the perhaps recreational mm -hmm. uh, market and, uh, as we speak today. Uh, so we want to discuss it, and so uh, let's start with the fact that, or the reasons why uh, caregivers remain relevant. Certainly. Uh, well, the, the main way that caregivers remain relevant is in the fact that we are currently in a situation where um, the, it is possible for caregivers, you know, to, for, for state licensed facilities to bring caregiver product into the system. Uh, there are currently two license types that allow that to happen. It's the medical grow facility and the medical processor facility. Those facilities can effectively receive product from a caregiver. That product gets entered into metric. If it can pass the safety compliance facility testing, then that batch of cannabis can be treated like any other batch of cannabis in the system. Um, and that is one of the main, I would argue, likely primary ways cannabis is entering into the medical system at this time. All right. <clears throat> so... You know, we're seeing a lot of caregivers uh, that are really seeking to uh, enter the market or remain in the market, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I'm seeing more and more people saying, you know what, perhaps it's too expensive to get a commercial license and perhaps maybe it would be just yep. more economical, uh, a lot less regulation to uh, have a caregiving grow. Yep. A lot of those caregivers who perhaps wound down their caregiving operations because of the new licensing you know, now realizing, oh, there's this new opportunity for product to come back in. Um, so I think we, we wanted to bring this topic up because it's, it's a backbone of bringing product into the medical system right now. Um, but it's also something that I think caregivers should really understand better. Um, basically, the Marijuana Regulatory Agency, the MRA, has, through, I believe, an executive order that was then kind of re-upped by a bulletin, said, if you're a state licensed grower, a state licensed processor on the medical marijuana side, you will not be punished for receiving this product from a caregiver, and then these are the steps to bring that product in. It's really important if you're a caregiver to understand what the MRA can and cannot do. The MRA has no ability to basically amend or change what your rights are under the 2008 Medical Marijuana Act. And that is the act that makes you a registered caregiver, and nothing in the MMMA says that a caregiver is legally allowed to engage in this transaction, and that is why I think we wanted to really start with this topic. Right, because uh, I think that it's probably a misconception that uh, because caregivers are now permitted to take their uh, product and then enter it or to give it to a processor or, or a licensed grower, enter it into the metric system, it seems as though that there's this lawful, uh, uh, like permiss permissible, uh, lawfully uh, activity. Um, but it's not, is it? It isn't, and I think like what not to say there isn't some sort of defense we could probably try to raise from the situation, there but be some, I mean, it, it reliance and entrapment, yeah. all kinds of things. But but if you just look at what the law says, and 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 remember that's at the end of the day what's going to cut it when it needs to cut it. The law says if you're a caregiver, you can grow product for a card connected patient. You're only a caregiver if a patient selects you to be your caregiver. And what you're growing is supposed to be for your patient. Now you can have up to 12 plants and you can only have up to two and a half ounces of usable marijuana per patient. We all know what the reality is of growing plants and those numbers and they don't make sense. We all get that. But the law protects you if you are helping grow cannabis for your patients. At the, in the grand scheme of things, as a caregiver, those plants and that product are for your specific patient. So, you know, quite frankly, if you look at the Medical Marijuana Act, you're only allowed to have enough marijuana to meet your patient's needs. So even if your pa some patients might need more marijuana than others, you know, just because everyone's growing 72 plants and has five patients doesn't mean, technically speaking, that you need that much marijuana for the patients you're helping. Uh, on top of that, though, and probably more importantly, nothing in the Act says you're allowed to engage in this transaction. In fact, if you look at Section 4, it specifically says, you know, a caregiver who sells marijuana to someone who is not allowed 
to receive this product under this act is punishable by a felony. <laughs> I mean, it literally says that. So um, now the MRA is the one that polices and, and, and governs license holders. So the medical license grow, the medical license processor can feel safe in receiving this product. They're protected. Because the MRA can protect them. They are li literally the ones who would punish them. The caregiver is not in the MRA system. I mean, it, to a certain degree, they issue the cards and things, but the, the law does not, in, in, basically have you, the caregiver, interacting with the MRA in, in operations. So I think the bottom line uh, that it's important for caregivers to know is that uh, the advisory bulletin and the executive order is protecting and seeks to protect the, the uh, licensee, the, the grower and the processor through the medical, excuse me, through the marijuana regulatory agency and not the caregiver. Uh, the next question then becomes, well, what's the caregiver's real true criminal liability and what's, their, what's, the, what's the potential for them to really get in trouble? It seems as though it's almost like entrapment. They're saying, go ahead, you know, provide your overages to, uh, to these licensed uh, growers and, and, and perhaps nothing's going to happen. But the fact is, is that it's possible something could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we'll move on in a second, but I, I, I've seen situations where caregivers are now have a significant amount of product that they're transporting from their grow to a facility. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a liability situation. Uh, again, caregivers are not protected under, under that permissibility. The, the licensees are. Uh, and, the, and depending upon where the caregiver is operating, where they're traveling, uh, depending upon the uh, the manner in which that county prosecutor or county sheriff's department feels as though that they could be prosecuting this or not uh, uh, could be an issue. Uh, sure. and, 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 and so the caregiver definitely needs to right. uh, protect themselves and perhaps understand that there is still liability. Right. And, and Proposal 1 obviously speaks to like the, the potential punishment if you, do, you know, step out of bounds in this situation and things. You know, Proposal 1 takes a lot of the criminality away from previous cannabis conduct and things. But, but one thing that just to kind of put a pin in this that I think if you're a caregiver and you're thinking about doing this, just keep in mind, you know, we all know before the MMFLA, caregivers brought product to these dispensaries and there was never really a paper trail. You know, no one's name was associated. You know, it was kind of all off the books. No one was regulating that conduct. But now these are licensed facilities and their books are open to regulation and, and review. So if they're going to be issuing you a payment to you for receiving this product, there's going to be a paper trail. And you know, in most cases, they're probably going to issue a W nine for the for the payment, so they can keep track of it on their books on and things. And and sure, the current situation, the current administration is probably. I'm not aware of any caregivers that have gotten targeted or punished. They they could be. I'm unaware of. But you know, that might not always be the case. If you're a caregiver today and you have a paper trail of providing products, you know, maybe that would imply that you had more than the usable amounts you were supposed to have. Or even worse, what if you're on one of these applications in the future when you submit your information? Tax returns, bank statements, all of this goes in for a background check. And, you know, the MRA, the ones reviewing you, also have all the records of the operators. So, you know, today maybe the MRA isn't really worried about caregivers and, and maybe you would have an issue on your pre-qualification, maybe you wouldn't. But if, you know, politics change or you're on this application in the future, now there's a record of you doing this and it might make it actually difficult for you to seek future pre-qualification if you're ever in a position to be on these licenses. It's also a good idea to recognize the fact that these W-9s that the operators are going to be then sending to the uh, IRS also mandates the fact that the caregiver is going to have to disclose or uh, 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 put that income on their exactly. tax returns. Because yep. if they don't do that, there's other records that demonstrate yep. Uh, and this, this is goes into a whole other issue too. Right. We could do a whole show on it probably, but yeah. suffice to say, it's a, it's a one-way protection. And if you're a caregiver doing this, just be very aware of what is and isn't being protected here. So, uh, but we still have a, I think, uh, an increase in the number of caregivers. Uh, Certainly. Now. There's been uh, uh, a, a lot more activity, a lot more people that are interested in getting into caregiving. I think, as I said earlier, one reason is because uh, it is, now being determined that it becomes it is a lot, it's expensive in order mm -hmm. to be able to get a, a, a license uh, yeah. class uh, you know, B or C license perhaps a little bit easier get a class A you know rec license but if the city is going to uh, if anyone lets you sure right. <laughs> um, so caregivers then are now looking for places where they can grow they don't have to grow in a home and they're recognizing that perhaps there's better places to grow and they're looking to uh, industrial or commercial properties. So mm -hmm. the next question becomes then, to what degree and, and what manner are they able to uh, grow legally in an industrial or commercial property in a city 
that has uh, opted out of, uh, of commercial um, marijuana. Uh, as we know, uh, there's many cities that have opted out, right? And these, sure. these cities have said, we don't want any commercial facilities. They've opted out of the, Recre uh, the Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, they've, and they've opted out of the Facilities Licensing Act. That's the uh, Commercial Recreational and Medical uh, Marijuana. Yep. That does not mean that they have opted out of the caregiving uh, program. They cannot opt out of the Medical Marijuana Act. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, well, how, what, what can a caregiver do in order to be able to legally operate in a facility or in a, in a business or in a, uh, uh, an industrial uh, property uh, or a commercial property outside of a home? What do they have to do? And so I'm getting a lot of questions as to whether they can get a uh, occupancy permit. Uh, and now, Caregivers have been getting occupancy permits for many, many, many years. Uh, Troy is a great example of the fact that Troy, the city of Troy, did not want to pass any ordinance uh, that would proliferate uh, caregivers, uh, but instead they, they recognized that they had to uh, provide occupancy permits because the Medical Marijuana Act basically says that a caregiver can grow anywhere they want. And if they want to try to have a little bit of control over the situation, providing an occupancy permit to ensure that they're doing so in a safe right. manner that is not gonna be in violation of, of their ordinance, then uh, at least then a, then a city is able to, to have a little bit of control over it. And then of course, we can also talk about what the city of Troy did, probably there, uh, that it was a little bit more than what most other cities are doing. Right. But they did pass a caregiver like registration or caregiver uh, uh, application in, to, in order to limit the number of caregivers. Right. And if, if you've been a caregiver before the MMFLA, this is not a new challenge. That this is, shouldn't sound new to you. You know, before we had the commercial side of licensing, you know, caregivers not all caregivers would be even capable of growing in a residential location. And you know, municipalities who are anti marijuana would try to put processes, systems, applications permit costs in place to usually with the goal of preventing cannabis conduct in non-residential locations or just in general in their communities. And, you know, we saw some of that pushback kind of grow and, and come, come back down. You know, Turbeek versus Wyoming was the big Supreme Court case from Michigan that kind of gave us one legal kind of defense for these situations. Um, and really once the MMFLA and then the RTMA were put in place, you know, municipalities were specifically given the right to zone cannabis conduct under those laws. And kind of while that was occurring and everyone was focused on the MMFLA and the RTMA, you know, the law that came first, the 2008 Medical Marijuana Act, it doesn't say municipalities have the right to stop caregivers from growing in specific locations. In fact, it literally says you cannot grow in three places, in the grounds of a school, in a correctional facility, or a school bus, which would imply to me that in theory you could grow anywhere else. And that used to be what we were doing in, um, you know, caregiver type businesses while we were all getting ready for the MMFLA to come along. And now with the growth of dependence on caregivers, regardless of our previous, you know, kind of warning at the top of the show, like most of the product I would argue in the systems coming from caregivers and the system relies on caregivers and caregivers have a wonderful economic opportunity, whether it's in the gray area or not, it's obviously one that people are taking advantage of. And as more and more caregivers are starting to want to be caregivers again, or, or perhaps just, you know, be a little bit more public about their caregiver activity, um, you know, it's becoming difficult for them and they're facing some of these old challenges about where and how they can do it. We have, uh, what's the case right now, Deruta vs. Uh, Township of Byron, Township of Byron yeah. where we have a caregiver who was growing in a commercial location challenging an ordinance that said she couldn't do that. And we're waiting for that opinion to come out, but the Court of Appeals said that ordinance, you know, wasn't allowed and we're hoping that's the conclusion that the Supreme Court takes as well. But this isn't new legal argument, it's just kind of from a different context now that we have more marijuana laws in Michigan. The Michigan Supreme Court should be uh, coming out with an opinion about that soon. They did an oral argument in December of last year, and uh, I'd say you know three months is about the time. Oh, I, I thought it was back in October. It's, it seems like it's been months. It might have been December. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the oral argument was in December. Gotcha. Um, but it should be coming out any day. And so yep. or I should say any day. Any week, Who knows, you know, right? Year, right? You never really. Know. By coming out right now for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> but it could certainly change. It will, I think, you know, mm -hmm. de define the the scenario of a caregiver and and the mm -hmm. relationship with the municipality. Uh, as of right now, uh, I think there's a very strong argument, and a lot of cities are complying with the fact. Uh, that and they didn't always do this. I had a bunch of cities, uh, you know, just a year ago say, no, we're not even going to let caregivers get an occupancy, occupancy permit. Mm -hmm. Whereas now they recognize that uh, 
Uh, they can't really stop it. They, they can't. They can regulate it. They can sure. do what was, what is necessary in order to be able to make sure that everything is safe and and and, yep. and it is compliant with uh, with the city's uh, uh, rights to be able to uh, take care of their community and look out for the the safety and health and welfare of uh, its residents. But um, stopping an occupancy permit is not likely going to be happening as long as the caregiver right. is wanting a, a reasonable opportunity to use their land see anybody has the ability to use their land there's a constitutional yep. right to be able to use it and so as long as the uh the person uh seeking to use their land uh is doing so in a reasonable manner the city's not going to be able to stop them from doing it the medical marijuana act is not gonna it doesn't it doesn't have the provisions necessary to be able to stop them from doing it everybody has the right to use their land right. uh in a in a reasonable uh in fashion so uh, caregivers uh, hopefully will continue to be protected and right and and, today. and don't forget like the the section four the 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 section of the medical marijuana act we use the entire time is the backbone of protecting caregivers says you cannot be denied a right or a privilege or punished for your lawful status as a card holding marijuana caregiver or patient which means if you're growing in an enclosed lock facility you're under your plant count you're under your weight count you are you cannot be penalized because you're a caregiver and the way we attack ordinances like this is they're drafted to penalize you or, or subject you to, you know, a elevated uh, payment, which we argue would be penalties and things like that, because you're a caregiver. That doesn't mean you get to ignore all the other laws. If they're not targeting you for your caregiver status, sure, there's a lot of things your community can make all citizens do. So, you know, that's when you're a caregiver in these situations, you have rights, but, you know, there's going to be pushback as more and more cannabis kind of comes into the fold here in Michigan. So with the uh, Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act that states that, that all persons over the age of 21 can grow uh, 12 plants uh, in their homes, in their residence, uh, mm -hmm. as long as there are no other uh, recreational grows in that particular residence. Yep. But it's silent and uh, leaves open to interpretation the degree to which that a caregiver is permitted to grow their number of plants in addition to their recreational plants. What's your comments sure. about that? Sure. So that's that's the, the famous question. We all know a caregiver can max out at 72 plants and now I'm an adult. Can I have 84 plants? I mean, it's my opinion, but I think it's justified. Yes, you can. You get 12 plants for each patient. Well, that's true. So hopefully everyone listens to me. You, when you're a caregiver and a patient, which you have to be both to have the plants, you get 12 plants for each patient you're helping. The five you're connected to as a caregiver and the 12 you get for yourself. Those plants are for your medical use. The RTMA allows a household and the adults in that household to have up to 12 plants for their recreational use. So as long as you keep your medical plants in the enclosed lock facility and you're under your amounts, just like you're supposed to be and I'm always supposed to be, you get 12 plants for medical use. And proposal one, the MRTMA says, I get 12 plants, you know, our household would have 12 plants for adult use. Um, I would highly recommend you don't have one grow room, keep them separate like you're supposed to. Definitely keep them separate. Keep, if you're a caregiver, you're the only one allowed in that enclosed lock facility. You're not allowed to have your patients come help you trim, all that stuff, everyone should know. But you know, in theory, in my home, if I have the space and the ability to do so safely, I think I'm defensible. I get 12 plants under law one, I get 20, 72 plants under law two, and as long as I comply with both laws, that adds up to 84 in my book. And uh, similarly, I think that you could also argue uh, that you could have, a caregiver could have their 72 plants located somewhere else. I think so. their recreational plants in their residence. Yep, the, the, now proposal one, unlike the Marijuana Act of 2008, like the Marijuana Act of 2008 specifically does not say you need to be in a specific spot. It just says there's three spots you can't be, which is why we would argue you can be in a lot of places such as commercial places, or agricultural places, industrial places. Proposal 1 is specific. It says it has to be in your residential home. And it also says, you know, my wife and I don't get 12 each, 12 per home. So, you know, those 12 plants have to be at the home. But your caregiver plants may or may not be at the home, right? And there are, uh, there's a bit of a difference with respect to having your 12 plants at a home and they don't have to be in a enclosed lot yep. facility, right? Yep, they have to be out of sight. You cannot have access to it if like, you know, there's children and things, you know, your neighbors can't see them through the windows. But it's a less of a, a you know, enclosed lot facility is a highly tested legal concept in, in, in several court cases where, it's been interpreted, right? e exactly, a, a thousand ways, which means there's all kinds of tests we use to decide is this the type of enclosed lot facility the law means or not. The RTMA is a lot more flexible. The RTMA says, you know, if, if it's in a locked, you know, area, you can't see it, you keep people out who aren't supposed to be in there, 
you're allowed to have it. Nothing says you can't have people in there with you. If I'm an adult and you're an adult, you can be in that grown room. It doesn't say we're not allowed to do that. You know, we're not talking, marijuana is not illegal anymore. And the, the reason the law was written that way for, for medical marijuana is because it was never really legal. It was just an affirmative defense. And if you stayed within the bounds of the law, you could raise that defense. If you were the caregiver and I was not, you have a defense you can raise. I cannot, right? On the RTMA side, cannabis is legal. I can be around a cannabis plant. It's just when I'm growing plants in my home. You know, I can't put them outside in the garden, open air to the sun. You know, people can potentially see them. I have to keep them somewhere out of sight, out of mind. You know, keep them away from kids, stuff like that. People talk about the reasons why the Marijuana Act and the uh, Facilities Licensing Act and the uh, Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act are so different. And uh, the biggest reason is, one, the Medical Marijuana Act was written and enforced or enacted 2008, mm -hmm. over 10 years ago, when clearly... Federal was, raids were happening. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the whole social yep. uh, scenario of cannabis was completely different than it is yep. now. Secondly, the Medical Marijuana, excuse me, yeah, the Facility Licensing Act was not a ballot initiative. It was written by the legislature, and so there's clearly going to be differences there. And then, with the, um, with the Recu uh, Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, now we're in 2000. 18 and we have uh, a relaxation of uh, marijuana laws and thoughts and, yep. and, and, and social uh, impact and then we have uh, what we really want is is trying to decriminalize it and keep the police from being able to like prosecute it reserve the rights for home growing i mean yep. it, so there's really like three uh, really significantly different acts that yeah. are all now trying to work with each other. It's something that uh, I'm on the marijuana work group with the, the attorney general, and it's something that we've been working on a lot, trying to figure out how to like yeah. harmonize these three things. Um, and it's not it's not easy. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember. I mean, it's not going to be shocking to anyone who follows cannabis law. I mean. Legalizing cannabis has been an effort in compromise. You know, in 2008, we, we got the victories we could get. That law's flaws are specifically because of one, we had to make compromises with people who weren't ready to legalize cannabis. And two, we had to design a law that was appropriate for the federal landscape at the time. You know, in California, there were literally raids of licensed cannabis facilities. Michigan, good or bad, designed a system that was basically immune to federal raids. We had small, non-commercial grows in every household that wanted one as opposed to state licensed easy to find easy to kick the door down and raid facilities that was probably very appropriate in 2008 doesn't really work super great in 2019 right um and you know we've had ballot initiatives we've had legislative uh laws through the mmfla and now we're starting to see new cannabis rights and new cannabis licensing being created through an administrative process you know if you look to the designated consumption license to the temporary event license uh, we're proposing a new delivery license. Now we're having a department who are basically creating new or, or limiting, depending on how you argue it, cannabis rights in Michigan. So, so we've had it kind of from a lot of different directions. We've had it uh, ballot initiative, legislatively, and administrative rule processes to give us, you know, to grow, shrink, and create cannabis rights in our state. Uh, absolutely. Well, I think the last thing we're going to discuss is a question that we get a lot. You probably hear a lot. I definitely hear a lot, which is, is the caregiving act or the medical marijuana act caregiving provisions is that going to go away is the legislature going to do something in order to make that go away is, is it is it going to be uh, around for a while a lot of people are like i want to be a caregiver but i'm scared that uh somehow it's going to go away and then i'm right. going to end up losing you know, you know like uh you know the investment that I, I put into that right um, what's your answer to that I mean, I think it would be, it's not impossible, but I think it would be incredibly unrealistic for the legislature to ever be in a position where a super majority of our elected officials want to amend the 2008 law. That's the way you amend it because it was a ballot initiative and it has been amended before. So it's possible to amend it, but I think there's enough of a patient and caregiver population as well as just general cannabis advocacy currently in the state of Michigan that that would be very difficult to, to muster the number of people needed to First, change the law, and then second, to change the law to do that. Um, you know, the systems we currently have very much, both economically and just politically, are relying on the caregiver system. So, uh, is it possible? Yes, technically. I think it's very, very unlikely. 
Um, what I always tell caregivers who ask me this question is what's much more realistic is that it will never go away, but we will continue to shift the economic dependence off of caregivers onto the new license types as we move forward. That's exactly correct. I totally agree. Uh, the caregiving system and the license uh, uh, registration is not going to go away. It would, it would necessitate not only three quarters uh, super majority, but also necessitate in order to be able to get that majority, we would have to have um, a significant movement away from that, and mm -hmm. I just don't see that going anywhere. I mean, the, care, the rights of caregivers are strong, and they're going to remain that way, I think, for, for a very long time, if not forever. So mm -hmm. I don't see that, that going away at all. But I do agree also that it, there are good, there is going to be a shift away from it at some point, uh, especially as there are more and more retailers and provisioning centers that are uh, licensed, of course, with also uh, growers and there's more marijuana that's entered into the uh, uh, into the commercial system. Uh, there's going to be less of reliance on caregivers. It's not going to it's not going to go away, uh, right. but there's going to be less of a demand, which I think will also uh, lessen the demand of the unregulated, unlicensed market, yep. which is something that uh, that's another issue that perhaps we can. Uh, discuss at another time as well. I just got interviewed um, twice actually by two different papers yesterday, or no, one today and one yesterday on that very issue is, is yeah. what is like the, because right now the unlicensed, unregulated market is is significantly high right now and yeah. for a lot of different reasons uh, and caregivers are participating in well, that to a significant I know we, we were going to talk about the cities that have opted in and out of, of adult use. We're probably going to scrap that for time at this point, but it's important to remember that there's not a lot of places that are opted in for adult use marijuana right now but there are some adult use marijuana facilities that open operating and, and, and right now and one of the main ways the adult use side of the industry is getting product is through an equivalent exchange if you have both the medical and adult use version of the license you could take up to 50 percent of your stock from the medical system and the adult use system and if you're the medical license doing that and half your stock's coming from the caregiver system that's how caregiver product should filters through these two laws into the hands of consumers when I go to a dispensary, I'm not a patient. When I go purchase adult use marijuana, I could effectively be purchasing marijuana that was originally grown by a caregiver. And I do believe just based on where the industry is and the economy, that is gonna be the case for probably several months. It's hard to say how long that's gonna be a thing. It's probably gonna be a factor of how many licensed businesses come online and eventually you know, the, the, the shortages of product in the system will probably at some point kind of stabilize out. But until you know, patients specifically have access to the medical needs they, they really need from the licensed system, I, I don't think the state's in a good position to turn that caregiver flow in. I just wish the state made better efforts to protect the caregivers who are doing that because we need them to do that, but the caregivers are the ones that aren't getting protected. That's right. Okay, well, we're going to end it uh, there, and uh, you certainly can get more information from our website, CannabisLegalGroup.com. All our videos are, videos are posted uh, on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. Uh, we will continue to do them and continue to answer the questions that we receive most in an effort to try to um, contribute to the, to the industry and to, uh, to the movement. So uh, for Travis, my, I'm Barton. Thank you very much for watching.